good morning it's morning time <laughs> um i've got the lovely laura here Hello. with me today i'm just opening my i don't usually have this so i will share it innocent bubbles because that cost i didn't have sparkling water and i've had to my caffeine oh. the day and that's what i can have for, <laughs> for a day anyway the lovely laura um i haven't actually known you that long mm. but i've known i know enough to know that you've gotten an incredible story to share uh -huh. incredible in terms of you've survived it mm -hmm. Um, so your page doesn't actually give away a lot of information but you haven't spoken openly about your situation till mm -hmm. very recently That's anyway right. and you've actually you've had people approach you you've said to me papers and other companies and film companies and whatever and you've never been ready to mm -hmm. properly share your story but yeah. you're going to share it with I us am. today <laughs> so you're in luck <laughs> I will. I have been talking about a lot of these issues recently and I just want to say that I will add a trigger warning to this as well because yours is um, domestic and sexual violence. So I will put a trigger warning. But the reason I was like keen to have you here is that I'm conscious that we speak to a lot of people that maybe don't get convictions. Mm -hmm. So Steph that I was speaking to yesterday, um, she got a conviction and so have you yeah. sadly it was a, a horrific experience you had to through to get that but mm -hmm. i think it's so important that we speak that we, we were able to i know no everybody is able to but thankfully yeah. you are brave enough to speak out now about the situations yeah. and things that have happened i think it's um, accepting as well what actually happened because for a long time i didn't accept this happened to me mm -hmm. i sort of i masked it and i ran away from it all I had a, I didn't tell my my parents even, they didn't know the truth until November last year. I know, this is all yeah. really new and mm -hmm. fresh to you. And I just want to say again, because I've said this to you off camera, you don't need to talk no. about anything that I you don't want to. I think it's time that people know. Mm -hmm. You're so Yeah, right. they know the background and my Instagram isn't just picture perfect, there is. There's a big story yeah, behind there's a, it. a real person behind that as well. Okay. So, you're Laura. Mm. What age are you, Laura? I'm 36. Right. And this situation happened or started what, when? What it age were you? It happened and started in Halloween 2015. Halloween, you remember the yeah, exact date? I remember every single date and that was like, lead, it, the whole abuse took place from Halloween 2015 till the 3rd of January 2016. So right. I was a missing person for eight weeks. I was moved right. from place to place. Okay, we'll start from yeah. the beginning. We'll hopefully get it all in, in the middle. <laughs> um, so if you get three kids? I've got two children. Two children, sorry. Yeah, two like children. I say, I don't know a huge uh -huh. amount about you, but you've got two children, right? So my oldest so, one was seven at the time. Right. So she's coming up for 16 now. So was he her dad? No. Right. Um, I met him through friends and associates, like friends of friends. And it started off love bombing, promising me the world every woman's dream like you'll not need to work we'll buy a big house we'll get married so you'll have an x6 to drive it was very much it was love bombing that i'd never experienced before so to me i was like wow this is amazing i've never had this from a man but at the time i didn't know what abuse was because i'd never suffered abuse mm -hmm. so the love bombing started and obviously i fell head over heels like oh my god i've met the man in my dreams and then little red flags started cropping up so he became insanely jealous when I didn't see him I was getting accused of things cheating um, talking to other men like it was just it was just constant accusations and then I felt like I had to like I had to sort of like stick up for myself and say well that didn't happen and then I would be running after him to to make it make him feel better Mm -hmm. instead of actually sticking up for myself and saying no that hasn't happened I, mm -hmm. I didn't have a backbone back then um at all i was very i was very naive i didn't know this world existed either mm -hmm. um i'd i've lived a shelter i'd lived a sheltered life before all this happened and i was brought up with morals and a good family home so i didn't know what abusers were at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. um so fast forward two weeks after meeting him, that was when the first sort of violence started. Um, it was on my birthday on the 17th of November. He got my phone and snapped it in half. Jeez. 
He must have had some strength. Well, that, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have said, why did you not run away? Why did you not do this? Oh. But this is, that is the worst thing that you can say, say to a victim yeah. because you're that consumed with their lies that you, you just believe this is reality. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it was apologetic and buy my new phone, I won't mm -hmm. do it again. And then the social media, I wasn't allowed to have that. So slowly I was deleting all my social media, changing my number, not speaking to my friends. And then the following weekend, I went, he didn't live up here. He lives 180 miles away. So I went down to see him and he kicked my car keys into the ignition to snap the immobiliser and told me I wasn't going, going home. And I was like, so I couldn't start my car. Mm -hmm. So at that time we didn't have keyless entry and stuff like that. Um, we went in this hotel, we stayed the night, and then he never slept a wink. So he was he had looked through my camera, like my photo album, and I'd been to Turkey about two weeks before I met him. And I, I'd met a girl um, on holiday and we were in the bar and a Turkish man had photobombed us, mm -hmm. just as you would on holiday. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He then accused me of being with this Turkish man and then he said he hadn't slept a wink because he'd seen this photo. So he was sitting, you know how hotels are set up, they've usually got the bed and then a table and chairs. Mm -hmm. He was sitting on the table and chairs and he was sitting rocking and speaking to himself. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then that was the first physical violence that I experienced. He jumped off the chair and kicked me straight in the face. Mm -hmm. I like right back and then I f obviously the first thing your, your instinct is to run away so I got mm -hmm. to the hotel door screaming help help trying to open the door and then he had me by the hair and he was just uppercutting me blow after blow after blow the blood was splattered up the walls my nose was burst there was blood all over the sheets and he was like you're going nowhere and I was like oh my god and I had lied to my parents where I was and they were frantic, like, where are you? Because they were watching my, my daughter at the time. And then I was slowly um, conditioned to believe that my mum and dad were bad people, that they were, like, I, I needed to get away from them, stay with him. He didn't want me to have access to my daughter. He didn't want me to have access to a job, my friends, mm -hmm. my family, my daughter. Slowly everything that I ever had positive in my life was taken away. So. I remained down there, obviously, to keep him happy. Um, but I was also, at the same time, protecting the people I loved because mm -hmm. I thought to myself, if he can do this to me, what can he do to them? Um, and he then ripped off my car. Um, and that was the first sort of ins instance that I seen that the family were all involved. So he, his family his were family, involved. Yeah, so they would enable his behaviour by protecting him. So when he wrote off the car, his sis, he ran away. His sister came and dropped off his sister-in-law. I got told to go in the driver's seat to put his clothes on and pretend that I was driving the car. And he was taken away by the sister. And that was when I was like, this is bigger than what. So they knew. They knew what so he was doing, but they protected him at all costs. So he must have had history he of did. doing it before. Um, but you wouldn't have I, I known wouldn't that. I wouldn't have known that. Um, mm -hmm. In 2010, he killed somebody. Um, and you didn't know? I knew he was on licence, but um, again, the family, because he, he'd done five years and eight-year sentence, which got reduced from murder to manslaughter. Um, and he served the five years, but the family were very much in the the head frame and they still are that the police are corrupt the police hate him and they set him up and he never done it and it wasn't his fault they took no accountability at all for his actions and neither did he so i knew he was on license for that but again i, I was so naive to this world i'd never known any sort of crime mm -hmm. or gangster sort of behavior i didn't know this world at all because again just I, totally naive yeah, to it. Um, I'd, I mean, I've, I've worked for the civil service since I was 18 and I've just, I've had like, I've, I still do, but I have a like, reputable job, like a, a professional job. And I just never knew this world. And I was like, I, I don't understand this. So then I became, I became like invested in it 
because I had to be. So I was changing my behaviour, lying for him, and covering mm -hmm. up for him. Obviously with the car accident, I said I was driving for him to get him off with it. And then like a few days later, things like, I wasn't allowed to look left or right when I was driving either. I got punched while I was driving for looking left and right out my, my mirrors or my windows. Um, there was, there was a time that um, we got stuck in the snow because obviously it was December. He was doing donuts in my car because he was a child. Um, and What's donuts? <laughs> it's when the handbrake in a field. Oh, yeah, I know so what you was, mean. I was didn't just know it was clowning about that. with my car mm -hmm. at the time and we got stuck and like a, a, a dog walker walked past and he helped push it out the mud. And I said, thank you, that was really nice of you. And then when I got in the car, I was like, what a nice man. That was nice of him to do that because that's just what a normal person would say in that mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. And he kept rocking again, saying, what a nice man, what a nice man. And then we'd, he was driving erratically. Um, this is what he used to do as well, terrorise me with fear. Um, he was driving erratically, elbowing me in the face and punching me in the face while he was driving the car. He drove for about a mile. The blood was just pouring out my, my nose and my mouth. And he then drove me to McDonald's and said, what do you want? As if it hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. It was just like he flicked a switch as if to say, like, we'll forget that now, what do you want to eat? But I was dripping in blood in the well, passenger seat. I, I, well. I was sitting at I was sitting at the window at McDonald's like, hello, can anybody mm -hmm. see me? But nobody, what somebody nobody help? batted an eyelid. And that's what made me think this isn't, this isn't that bad because nobody's bothered. So that, that was that was like a daily occurrence. He put cigarettes out of my eyes, stuff like that. Like he, he chased me around with knives. He lit um, aerosol cans, like deodorant cans, like a blowtorch would chase me around with that. Pretend, he tortured like, you? Yeah, absolutely tortured me. Um, there was one instance that he took me up to a derelict road, told me that he was going to kill me. Nobody would ever see me ever again. Dragged me out of the car. And at this time it had been snowing. So we were up a country lane he dragged me to a pothole full of muddy water and he was putting my head under the water, lifting it, punching, kicking me, putting me back under. And I'm sitting, trying to no drown at the same time. Um, and I genuinely thought he's going to kill me. He took all my um, like material things, like my handbags, because I like my de designer stuff, all my handbags, makeup, everything like that. He was burning it, slashing it with knives. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get home to my daughter. Because that was the, the main focus every single day was I need to stay alive to make sure my daughter doesn't bury her mum. Was um, she with your mum and dad the she whole was time? With, yeah. She didn't witness any She didn't witness like any of it, but there was an occasion I ran away, I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, so he dragged me up these puddles, he threw all my, my possessions in a river and across a river bank. He didn't pick up his mess though, which was good because the police were able to get that when eventually they did rescue me. Um, so I was soaking head to toe in muddy water. My eye was burst open. I was in absolute shock. It was freezing cold. Um, and then he stopped again and said, get in the car, we're driving. So I, I had to drive back to his parents' house. He told me to sit in the drive and his brother and mum came out and they helped me. I couldn't even walk. I was that in that much pain. I couldn't even walk. Um, and they took me into the family house, stripped me off, put me in a shower, washed me, got rid of the clothes that he had obviously destroyed. But they saying anything to you this whole I wasn't, time? I wasn't allowed to mention what he did. If I told anybody, so it was just unspoken about. It was about. spoken about. That was not. I wasn't even allowed to mention he did this because if I told them he did it, I would get another beating. Oh God. So. I just thought I'm never going to get away from this. Like, how am I going to escape this? My mum at the time, she was frantic. Um, Still no contact with your mum? Like, phoning the police every day saying I was missing. There was times that the police did did actually take me into police stations, but he would give me a mobile phone to put in my bra for him to listen to what I was saying outside in the car park. In hindsight, I wish I'd just got a bit of paper saying I'm in danger, pretend to arrest me. I wish I'd done that, but at the time, the, the, fight, or flight, the fight or yeah. flight at the time mm -hmm. is just, mm -hmm. I need to say what I need to say to 
not get another beat in because that would be the consequence of saying something wrong to the police. Mm -hmm. But I was rehearsed into saying I'm not held under duress, I'm here on my own free will, I've got nothing to say. But I was sitting in a police station with cuts, bruises, black eyes, um, swollen, swollen cheeks, like my nose was, it was like sideways um, and obviously the, the lip that he, I don't know if I got to this, but he burst my lip open. It was actually in half, well, that. Um, mm -hmm. but that again was just repeated blows to the face. He kept giving me elbows, kicks, um, punches to the, the face to the point that my lip split in half and it was flapping in two. So he, he kept doing it and then I was sent to like a walk-in centre because they have walk-in centres instead of casualty down there. And I was told... Was it in England? Yeah, no. I was in the Durham area. Right. Um, so I was moved all over Durham for this eight weeks. I wasn't really in the same place ever. And then obviously I never had a mobile phone. you endured phone. eight solid weeks eight of so torture. Eight solid weeks of torture. And the obviously the, the lip, I had to get sewn back together by plastic surgery, but I was taken again. I was chaperoned all the time by a member of his family or him. So I wasn't allowed to speak on my own free will. So I was chaperoned to the hospital they actually took medical photography of that the injury which helped helped the court case so the me the medical photographer took took photographs i was put on a bed in a, a theater awake getting my lips sewn back together um I, I lost consciousness on that table as well um i kept having panic attacks and fainting and you name it so that happened, but as soon as I got out of the hospital, he burst the closed wind opened again. And it was just like, what is the point? Like, this is just going to be my life now. Like, I'd sort of, I'd sort of like come to the, the decision that I've got myself in this. I'm going to have to just put up with it. So God. this was like the middle of December. This happened around about the 12th or 13th. And at the time I was handing in sick lines to my work. You were still a civil servant yeah. at the time? Yeah, I, I used to be a trainer, so I trained staff. Mm -hmm. um, so I was handing in sick lines, but I had to actually physically hand this one in. So I was I was driven up from Durham to hand a sick line in on my mum's birthday. This is, it was all like significant events. So it was the 19th of December, this one. So we decided to just stay in my house um, instead of driving back down and obviously drive in the morning instead of driving all night long. So we stayed in my house and again this sort of rocking and mm -hmm. um, started. He was looking through my laptop. He found that in 2010 I was in the BCM nightclub in Magaluf and two black men kissed the side of my cheek. So that threw him off in a fitted age. I was getting whacked across the face with a metal broomstick they were just absolutely like full force smacking me across the face with this broomstick. And his brother and sister-in-law sat with their backs to me while this was happening. And I just was like, oh my God. And then he calmed down and he said, let's get food. But he took a knife out of my kitchen drawer and he, we were in the back seat of, of his brother's car when we went out for this food. Obviously I wasn't hungry at all. Um, and he sat looking at me with this knife, licking it. And he was like, if, if you say a word, I'm going to open your face up like a Mars bar. Because a lot of this terminology is to do with prisons. So I didn't know what a Mars bar was, but seemingly they cut you open so that you scar in a way that it looks like a Mars bar on your face. Because he didn't want any other man to look at me ever again. Like I was his, pro I was his possession, I was his property. Like... I was never I was never to look at another man, so I was sitting in the back of this car in my hometown, mm -hmm. just like hoping somebody would see me or would they would somebody would yeah, save somebody you. would save me. It didn't happen. So we went back to my house with this food I never ate. And then he decided to go up to my wardrobe and he was searching through absolutely everything. He was getting all my clothes that I used to go out clubbing with and stuff like that and he was he had another knife. And he was just like ripping them to shreds. My Jimmy Choo shoes, snapping the heels off them, putting knives through my bed, my telly. And then he said, if I find anything in here, 
from another man, you're getting it. He went through every single drawer, everything in my, my room, and he found a bodybuilding, um, bodybuilding magazine that was actually my ex's from like three years before, but it had been like shoved down the back of a set of drawers. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, is this what you like? You like this sort of man, is that right? And that, that was him again, kicked off. I, was, I got punched in the face to start off with, and then he kicked me the full length of my landing into my daughter's room and he had to me on the bed with a knife at either side, stabbing me either side of this bed. Like my head was on the bed stabbing either side of me. And I was just like, oh my God, like what? How is, like, I was screaming, like I was screaming blue murder because I was absolutely terrified. And obviously the noise that his brother and sister-in-law were down the stairs <sighs> again, doing absolutely nothing. Um, and then he told me to tidy up for us to go to bed. So I was tidying up my daughter's room because he'd trashed that, he'd put knives through her clothes and stuff like that as well. Didn't He didn't like the fact that I would always love her more than I would love him. Mm -hmm. So he told me to tidy up. So I was at the other side of her double bed <clears throat> and he was looking at me and he said, I'm going to come round the other side of that bed and I'm going to hang you from a forearm till you're unconscious. And I was like, what? And he walked around the side of the bed before I could even process what he'd said. And then I was hanging from his forearm and I was trying to pull his arm off me. But at that, by, the, by the neck? By the neck. I was dangling from his arm. So I was trying to pull him off me. And I, But at that point, I just thought, Laura, you've, you've took enough. It's time to go. Was that, was that the breaking point for you? No. <laughs> There's another five months to go after this. Um, <clears throat> it was the time I sort of, I, well, I'll tell you what happened. So I went, oh, I just thought to myself, I'm going to, I'm going now, like it's time to go. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm, I'm going to die now. So I closed my eyes and I did think I was dying. And I woke up for consciousness with him trying to resuscitate me, slapping my face. And then I had a seizure, I went into a seizure and I urinated myself on the carpet. Oh my God, Laura. So I then, obviously when I regained consciousness, he was like, what? he was thinking this was funny. And then he, then he turned the fact that I'd urinated myself as being a black bitch. And then I got a beating for that, for, for a natural thing that your body does when you- Go into that. Go into that shock. shock. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got another beating for that and we went to bed and he told me, like I said to him when we went to bed, I said, I'm not coming back down with you tomorrow. I'm staying here. And obviously his brother and sister-in-law was in the room next to us and he said, you're coming. And I was like, I'm not, I don't want to come. And he was like, you're coming or I'll, I'll kill you. I'll kill you and I'll leave your body in the house for your daughter to find. And I was like, I need to go. So I went back down on, that was the 20th, but my mum and dad didn't even know that I was in Scotland. I was literally a mile away from them mm -hmm. and they didn't even know. Um, luckily, my next door neighbours, they heard the screaming, they heard the noise and they seen the injuries that I had sustained the next morning. So back, back down south again we went. Um, but that was my sort of, that was my awakening to think I need to stay alive now. Like I need to stay alive to make sure I get home. Um, so my daughter's birthday was the 22nd of December. And at this point he had me sleeping in a car. I wasn't sleeping under a roof. I was sleeping in the back seat of a car. And he was inside and I was outside sleeping. And that was the 21st of December. The police actually came and checked my welfare because I was sitting in a car, a lone female sitting in a car, sleeping. And I was like, oh, I'm fine. Um, and then, like obviously it was my daughter's birthday, the 22nd. I waited and I was getting paid that day. So I waited till there was money in my bank. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. I drove to the petrol station. I dropped his stuff off at his parents' house. And I drove home. Honestly, the, I've never felt anxiety like it. My heart was just like absolutely thumping at my chest thinking I'm going to get caught, I'm going to get caught. And I got to my parents' house 
about half five in the morning, half six o'clock. And I'd just climbed on the bed with my daughter and I'm going to get upset. <laughs> trying to I woke up. Well, we can stop. No, it's fine. If you want. Um, I'd rather people see their own uh, emotion because. Uh, no, that's fine. It's just fine. Feel, uh, I'll, I'll cry, but. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hold it together. I'm honestly, God, I can't comprehend sounds, it. It just sounds real. Like, it, I've, I've climbed in her bed and she woke up and she gave me a cuddle. And then. I've got a hang. No, it's fine. She gave me a cuddle mm -hmm. and I just said, Happy birthday, darling. But the whole time that I was lying in her bed, I just could not stop staring at her because I thought, I've got her. I'm back. You're all right. Man. I know. I'm back. Um, and then she ran through at my parents' room to say, Guess what? Guess what? Mummy's home. Mummy's home. And my mum at the start, we went down the stairs. My mum, she was angry because I'd left her. They didn't know why, um, and she was wanting to know a million questions. And I was like, "Mum, I'll tell you that I'll tell you the truth. Just let her open her birthday presents. Um, I'll tell you what happened, but just let Darcy have her birthday." Um, and then my dad came down the stairs, and my mum was still giving it hundred questions, and my dad said, "Stop there. Look at the state of her face," because my jaw was out to hear at the time, and I had two black eyes. My nose was squint. Um, and he said her jaw's broken like look at the state of her face so on my daughter's birthday we went down to casualty it was just tissue da damage that he'd, he'd given me but obviously there was a lot of bruising a lot of damage to my face um, we went to hospital the consultant was like I need to phone the police and I said please don't because like, I, like, I knew it would cause more trouble if I went to the police so we went to Toys R Us, came back the afternoon. Everything was fine, thinking I'm, I'm away. I'm away for it, like I'm, I'm free. He turns up at the door in the afternoon with his brother. And I just think, oh my God, my mum answered the door. So instantly I went to the front door to protect her. Went out and spoke to him. My dad turns up in his work span and says, is this she here to give my daughter another beating? And he looked at me as if to say, you've told them. You're, and it was the same look as if to say, you're getting it. And I just thought, oh my God. I was like, dad, just don't say anything. Don't don't say anything. Please just go. Um, and he, he did leave, he eventually did leave. And then the phone calls and the, the threats, he was gonna kill me, he was gonna kill my family, put my head on a stick in their garden, take my head off with a shotgun. And I, I genuinely believe he would do that. Mm -hmm. um, genuinely believe he's capable of it as well. So it came to Christmas Eve. He was then love, he was hoovering me because this is what they do, they hoover you back up. And then the love bombing started again. It's a cycle of abuse. And he was saying, I'm going to come, I'm going to come up for Christmas, stay with you. We'll, we'll like sort things with your family. Like, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. I believed him stupidly went back down on Christmas Eve and as soon as I, as, as I got in the car I knew I wasn't going to get home for Christmas. He he had an engagement ring and he said to me, you're putting this ring on, we're engaged now. It was no like fancy proposal, it was you're putting it on. And I said, I'm not putting that ring on. Um, and he kept saying, you're putting it on. And I said, I'm not. So every time I said no, he punched me. And he said, you're going to put the ring on? And I said, no, he punched me again. And it was the only time, the only reason I put the ring on was because he'd punched my teeth back. So I had to actually physically pull my teeth forward, um, put the ring on. And then of course, he was sending photos to my mum and dad as if to say, guess who I've got? And in the photos, you, I seen them in court. You, my eyes are absolutely filled up with tears. I look terrified um, and you can see like my face is swollen as well and they just were my mum and dad were devastated obviously because I didn't tell them I was going and I didn't think I didn't think he would do that because I genuinely believed he was telling the truth this time but of course he wasn't so Christmas Eve we stayed in a hotel <laughs> like no no wakening up to a Christmas 
day presents. There was none of that. Um, that afternoon we went to another hotel. You didn't see your daughter? I never see my daughter on Christmas. And I'll never ever forgive him for that. I'll never forgive him for, or forget that he came up on her birthday and took away a Christmas completely. So on that Christmas day, I was tied to a bed and he was using a dangerous object to rape me. Um, and he was t saying, I was getting raped before that. Um, there was an instance that we were in a another hotel because he was moving me to hotels. And I had a migraine because I do suffer from migraines and I just wanted to sleep. And he was like, we're, we're having sex. You're no sleeping. And I said, I need to sleep. Like, I need to sleep this off. And then he had wires pulled out, like telephone wires, tying the door handle so I couldn't get out the room. He was filling the kettle up with sugar and boiling it and boiling it and boiling it over and over again and chasing me around this hotel room with boiling hot sugared water. I said, I'm going to burn your co uh, toes off if you don't sleep with me. And I was just like, this is just an absolute nightmare. And it was like, I was just doing whatever he said to pacify him. It was not because I wanted to, it was because I was pacifying him and doing anything to avoid getting another beating. So that instance, obviously I slept one, but the, the hotel on Christmas day, I was tied to a bed and getting a sexual assault that they call it down there, but I would still say that's rape. Um, it's no different. So on Christmas Day, I was getting raped while everybody was eating their Christmas dinner. And then Boxing Day, um, we were taken to Leeds because his sister-in-law lived in that area. And we walked around the shops like a normal couple, to be honest. And then I was accused of looking at a black man. He was very racist, very racist. So I wasn't allowed to even have eye contact with men, but black men or any other ethnicity was just a big, huge no-no. Um, I was getting accused of that and then I got assaulted in the back of his brother's car while his brother was in the pa in the driver's seat and I was just like this is an absolute nightmare but he started assaulting me out in the street and then put me in the back seat and I was like why is no like I just didn't understand why is nobody stopping mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helping and I just felt invincible like I just felt invisible sorry that nobody was even registering that this was happening and I was just it was just like it was it was okay because nobody was bothered. Mm -hmm. So that Boxing Day That's what I Yeah, Boxing Day between Boxing Day until New Year's Eve he was more well behaved than what he normally was, so I wasn't getting beaten up as often as I was. My injuries started to die down. Um the whip was still obviously not healed. Um and then on New Year's Eve, the, we went to another hotel and again, he got another dangerous object and did what he did on Christmas Day to me twice. But it was, are you allowed to swear? Mm -hmm. You can say um, He would say, fucking take it, fucking take it every time he was ramming this dangerous object in somewhere it shouldn't be. And I was absolutely screaming because it was agony, like wanting it to stop. And obviously, but he was getting pleasure out of seeing me in pain. The judge actually did describe him as being sadistic because... Well, I'm thinking psychopath, but actually... Yeah, <laughs> sadistic, mm -hmm. like he, he actually got sheer like pleasure out of seeing me in pain. Um, he did actually say that to me further down the line as well. So New Year's Day, um, it happened again and eventually on the 3rd of January I was driving and this was the first time that I'd been driving alone because he had asked me to go and get cigarettes and juice for him at a garage and I drove up this dual carriageway and the traffic police stopped me and I was like is there anything is there anything wrong and they were and they said can you pull into a service station so we do checks so that, and it's safer and then off the road. And I got in the service station and turned round and it was just swarmed by undercover CID running to my safety and saying, you're safe now, Laura, we've got you. Oh, He's arrested. Um, they took me to a safe house. They hid my car. 
and putting a safe house 50 miles away from his house. How did that come about? How were you, how were they alerted so in the end? In the end, it was actually my old manager. So on Darcy's birthday, I forgot to mention this. So after, before he came up, I'd went through to my work and, but I'd emailed my boss to, a picture in my face. He mm -hmm. emailed him two pictures to say, this is what I look like, just so that you're not shocked. Um, and I went in with another sick line and he had a witness and he and I told him everything that had happened and I and he wrote a statement with a witness to that effect. He went to the police with that. Thank God for he, him. He went yeah, he saved my life. Oh god. He did. He did he oh save my god. life. Um so the police the police up here I would say were no good at all. They 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 raided my house by armed response on New Year's Eve, but I was I was 180 miles down the road, so I was found in Middlesbrough, um, which was like 200 miles away from my house. Um, the police raided my house up here with armed response forensics, and they were looking for my dead body. They they told my parents I was presumed dead, so they thought that I was I was killed. Um, they would know his, his history mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and my mum and dad had been told a lot about it and they protected. At the time, I hated them for it because they, they didn't let me get access to my daughter. I hated them for it, but looking back now, thank God they did that mm -hmm. because God help her if she had been in mm -hmm. his company or mm -hmm. even witnessed, mm -hmm. witnessed this. Like what she witnessed was enough. Like she's seen the injuries on her birthday mm -hmm. that I'd sustained. And then she's seen me when I eventually came home as well. So after he was arrested, I was taken to this safe house. And the following day I did, it's called an EBE down there. So you give a video statement a bit like this. And that's your 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 best evidence. So you don't have to stand up in mm -hmm. court and um, provide evidence. So it was about eight hours long, this statement. and. The incident when I'm telling you about the dragging me through the in the puddles at that river, I couldn't I couldn't picture where it was on a map. But I said if you take me in a car, I'll be able to show you. Mm -hmm. So they bundled me in a um, CID car, and I was in the back seat and a hoodie lying in the back seat. And I told them where all these places were that um, he had destroyed things and incidents had happened. And again, within five minutes, the crime scene investigators were out in their white suits with their yellow flags and I was just like this is just like something of a movie like I don't even feel like this is real life this feels like surreal absolutely mm -hmm. surreal so I gave a statement and I thought right this is me finally getting away from him away from him the following day I never had my car because the police had taken it off me to mm -hmm. make sure that because I had quite a, a visible car at the time um, there was there was only one of them sort of thing. It was mm -hmm. like a one off sort of looking car, so they've taken that off me and kept that in sort of the police co compound. So I got a train into Newcastle town centre, and I'd kept my SIM card, my old phone, in the bottom of my bag. He had destroyed everything: my passport, my driver's license. That was all taken off me. My phones, they were all smashed. So I went and got the SIM card, put it in my mobile a mobile phone that I bought. And I had about 20 missed calls and messages for his number. And I was like, oh my God, he's out. Like, he's he's been released. So I phoned his number. His sister answered. And she was just like, oh, like, it's fine. Like, we'll come and get you. He's getting out. And I was like, you're having a laugh. So the sister and sister-in-law came and picked me up. We we got nearly back to their, their home. And we were boxed in by undercover X5s because and I jump out the, her car and went in the police undercover car and on the screen it said may contain missing person Laura McNaughton because I had been reported missing again and I told the police the same rehearsed spiel that I'd been told I'm here under my own free will I'm not heard, heard, heard under duress and mm. I was just like I was so conditioned and warped into thinking this is normal Mm -hmm. um, and I was covering up for him like I was I wasn't telling the truth my truth I did tell the truth in the first statement but then soon after that a couple of days later his family told me how to 
retract the statement and they they sort of um, pressured me into doing that so I was sent to solicitors that they know they knew um, in Newcastle to write an affidavit which is a legal statement and um, witnessed by a, a solicitor that affidavit was then put into the police and his his barrister because um, they'd been charged with seven offences that they could prove but the seven offences were just a day in the life of I wouldn't say that was everything that he did well it wasn't you know he mm. did so much more but obviously they could only prove what evidence they had um so he had seven offences and the worst two were three sexual offences um his family did not like the fact that he was a sexual offender because that would bring shame to their family so they wanted him off for the sexual offences more than mm -hmm. the assaults um so I was then sent to the, I was I was sent to his solicitor with a letter that I had to write in front of his parents. I wrote, I wrote it about two or three times, writing this letter of what happened in my own words. Mm -hmm. And his dad was sitting with surgical gloves on and tweezers, <sighs> flicking through the pages, telling me to add bits in, take bits out. But I was like so panicked to write this letter, like I'm, like I'm just try to stay alive here like what's going to happen to me and my family if I, I don't do this because I thought this is the right thing to do to retract it to get away from them so eventually I, I wrote this letter I went to his solicitor with it and then I had a police interview to retract the statement and the the police see well, the CID that um, interviewed me first I accused her of being corrupt manipulating the truth influencing the truth and I've, that's my biggest regret because sh I should have just stuck to my guns. So eventually I was let home. I was let, I was allowed to go back home mm -hmm. to my own house, go back to work. But he was controlling me from prison with a mobile phone that he had in prison. So I was sending money to bank accounts. I was getting told if I didn't, he would commit suicide, kill himself. And... I just was so, I was so wrapped up in this abuse that I thought I need to do as I'm told. So I was doing what I was told. I was going, I was driving down, visiting him for an hour and a half and going back home. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that once a week. I was taking phone calls from him at work all night, text messages, letters, emails. And then eventually I was like, I need to get away from him. How am I going to get away from him? And I started to sort of like, reduce the amount of contact, making excuses, I can't come down, or mm -hmm. I'm busy, I can't answer the phone. And then I stopped writing to him as much, stopped visiting him as much. And then I was like, right, I'm ready to finish this. This was the May, May 2016. And I messaged him and said, it's over, do not contact me again. Um, phoned his parents and said, it's over, make sure he doesn't contact me again. And I then got a phone call from two men with the same accent saying they were on their way up to abduct my daughter, kill her and put her skull through my front window. And I just thought, I need to get away from this now. Um, luckily, I was very clever in what I did. I had a personal mobile that I kept for friends and family and I had one mobile that only him and his family and friends had. So I gave the police up here the mobile, told them he was contacting me for prison, he was going to kill me or kill my daughter. Um, and they did nothing. But Women's Aid, thankfully, stepped in and put me and my daughter in a refuge probably about a week later. So we went in a refuge. Absolutely hated it because um, it wasn't my usual luxury living or lifestyle but I was safe and my daughter was happy. That was one thing, she was happy to have her mum back in a safe place. So uh, because he had trashed my old house in December, there was knives through everything, my sofa, my tellies, my bed, everything was destroyed, my furniture. So I left that refuge with a mattress and two jet deck chairs and I had to build myself back up. Um, so I sort of forgot about him because he got left in prison because he had to serve the rest of that manslaughter sentence until March 2018. 
So March 2018 came, the police contacted me to see he was getting released. Um, I was actually under MARAC at the time, which I don't know if you've ever heard of. It's, no, it's no. called the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Committee. Oh, I have. Committee. I, have so mm -hmm. I was at high risk of getting murdered. Um, yep. Um, I was at high risk of getting murdered. So they basically gave me all these panic alarms and stuff like that to make sure if he was to come in, mm -hmm. I had, had some sort of access to to protection so I got that installed my mum and dad got that installed and I had a mobile phone that was like a decoy mobile phone that had GP GPRS on it that I had to just press and the police would know where I was if I was outside of the house so I had all this um, sort of protective measures put in place but I was absolutely terrified mm -hmm. that he was going to come out and he was going to come for me so the day he was released my, I went down to London with my daughter went for the week, like a long weekend and I was flying home on the date the night that he was released um I think it was Monday the 18th or 19th of March um 2018 I was on an easy jet flight <laughs> and when I got home I realized my Facebook had been logged into by somebody in his area while I was flying 33,000 feet in the air and I was like, oh my God, he's hacked into my Facebook now. And I sort of left it. Um, and then it was probably about five weeks later, it was in the May, um, I was at work and I got a phone call from a sergeant. And he said, do you know where he is? And I said, no, why? And he said, he's on the run. He's done it to somebody else. And I was like, you're joking. But when he, before he was released, I actually went to the police and said, I'm ready to tell the truth now. But the, because I had retracted the statement in 2016, the amount of, amount of hurdles I had to go through for it to get to court, it took about a year and a half. And that's why I've waited, waited so long plus COVID, so I'll get to that. So he was on the run for this other girl that he had done the same to. Um, he had her for a week tied up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let this go on by the way, I only yeah. usually, I, um, but you're not going to get your story in for an hour so I think under the circumstances mm -hmm. I'm just going to let it yeah, go, it just, run uh, until you oh, tell your story. You. Um, he had her for a week, um, false imprisonment, he raped her in front of our children, he kept her children locked in a room without food or nappies and that broke me because I thought if I had just been able to tell the truth. You can't blame yourself though, but I, you don't need me no, to tell you that. No, I, I mm -hmm. don't feel like that now, but at the mm -hmm. time I just, I was broken. Like, oh my God, I know what that girl has been through. If, he's, if it was anything like what he did to me, I know what she suffered. So I helped the police get him arrested but his family were actually protecting him from getting arrested at the same time. But he eventually did get arrested. Her court case wasn't until January 2019. He was found not guilty for all the rapes, which was sickening, sickening because I know for a fact he raped her. Um, and I was, I was so broken at that verdict because of a sad, I'd, reinstated my statement in between this so it was a September 2018 I reinstated the statement and said I'm ready to tell the truth and I'm going to tell you why I retracted the statement in the first place because I was pressurised by the family mm -hmm. and I was pressurised by him because he told me if I ever left him he would tie me up, tie him up castrate him murder him, murder me and kill himself and I genuinely believed he would do that like genuinely believed he would do that um, so that eventually he was sentenced for the other girl in the July 2019. So it took, this This was a lot to do with him as well. So he would try and stop court cases. He, he stopped He stopped court cases a lot just by knowing the system and playing the mm -hmm. system so that he didn't have to, to go through trials or go through sentencing. But he only got seven years for that girl. So my charges weren't reinstated till the November 2019. I had a mental breakdown from then onwards. Um, 
I was I was diagnosed with PTSD in March 2019, but I had went three years suffering and I didn't know what was wrong with me, but it wasn't until I was pregnant with my wee one, which I called her Mercy, um, because she was my thank you. She saved my life because mm -hmm. there were so many times I just thought I need to just end this. Like, how am I ever going to come back for this? How am I ever going to survive and be the person I was before I met him? Um, so there's been so many times I've thought, like, how can I, how can I end, end my life? Um, so the charges were reinstated in the November. He went to court in my January 2020, pled not guilty, which I was fully expecting. And then obviously COVID hit. So the court case was just put back and put back and put back. And then eventually, it was April 2021, I went to the Crown Court, um, gave four days evidence. And then a member of his family entered the court, caused, caused a scene because I was one in. It was a 10 day court trial, caused a scene, he got arrested and then the trial had to stop because the jury were involved. Um, so it was then sent for a retrial and I just thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go through this again. Cause I was so close and ending my, mm -hmm. my evidence and I knew I was winning. Like I knew I was winning and that's why it had to get stopped by his, his member of his family. So eventually about three court dates later, they were all canceled and last, July, it started the end of July and 10 days of my life <laughs> was taken. My mum and dad were also witnesses. So a lot of this, they didn't know. They didn't know the truth mm -hmm. because they were witnesses and I couldn't tell them what mm -hmm. had happened because that would contaminate their evidence or or, or maybe like give them a, 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 worse, a worse idea in mm -hmm. their head of what he is. Mm -hmm. So the trial went ahead this time and I was just like, cause I was just waiting for something to happen. Every single time before that, it was like the week before, the day before, something would stop the trial. And it was main, it was majority of the time it was him doing something to stop it. So for it to get to the actual jury, going out to deliberate the decision, they took two and a half hours, came back and it was unanimous that they found him guilty on all charges. I can't really remember what the police said to me down the phone because I was screaming the whole time because I never thought I would get to this stage that it was going to be over. Um, so my mum and dad were hysterical as well. Yeah. My mum and dad great. were hysterical as well because mm. and that was the first to me telling them seven years down the line that I had the been raped. Yeah, my dad didn't know I was raped and I didn't want to tell him because I knew that the other girl's charges were found not guilty. And I thought, you know, what if mines are found not guilty? I don't want my mum and dad to know what he did to me because it's every parent's worst nightmare. Like obviously I'm a parent myself and I would I'd probably kill somebody if they did that to either of my daughters. Um, so my mum and dad were really, really broken. Um, and then what I did was a victim personal statement, which was going to get read out in the sentence and it was meant to be in the September. Again, it got cancelled because his barrister or something was on strike. And then it went to Halloween and I thought, oh my God, this has mm. went round in one circle. Because, and this is just last year, this yeah. isn't even six months ago. I know, it's enough. just a few mm -hmm. months ago. Mm -hmm. So it, got, it went to Halloween 2022, which was seven years to the date that I met him and I thought this is just karma coming back round in itself. I chose to read out the victim personal statement because I was offered the prosecution to read it out on my behalf but I said no I'm reading this out because this is, this is my story mm -hmm. and I want it to come from my, my mouth. Um, the, the the police said there wasn't a dry eye in the, in the um, courtroom. courtroom because it was so powerful what I, I, wrote, like I wrote and I read it out. And then it took about two and a half hours for the judge to come to his decision. And the first charge was the lip, the, the lip assault. And they gave him two years. And I was like, oh my God, 
and the next one was a year, the next one was three months, the next one was two months. And I was like, he's getting out because he had done three and a half mm -hmm. years of remand for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, he's getting out. And then when it came to the first sexual offence, the sentencing criteria starts off at like 1A, 1B, which is the worst, 2A, 2B, and then 3A, uh, 3C, 3D. And the judge started reading out his reasoning for what sentencing criteria he was going to use. And the minute I heard 1A, I thought, thank God, mm -hmm. thank God, like there is a Lord, like my prayers have been answered, this was worth something, because I just thought the three and a half years that he was given the first four charges, like what have I done this for? Like I've put myself through, because my life's been on hold. Mm -hmm. I've I've been single, I've been on my own. I've I've literally stopped my life for this court case to make sure that all my focus was on this court case because I didn't want there to be any other distraction away from it because it was so important that I get, like, I've got him a long time for this mm -hmm. um, and the other girl mm -hmm. and the man that he killed because he deserves, his family deserves it as much because eight years for a life is just never enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I knew that I had to to remain strong to make sure that everybody else that's ever suffered at his hands got a bit of justice. So when I heard the 1A, I thought, oh my God, that was a minimum of 12 years. Mm -hmm. So he gave him 15 years for that. And I was, and I was just like fist punching, mm -hmm. like, yes. Um, and the, the other two assaults, sexual assaults, got combined as one. And that was 17 years that it gave he gave for that combined but adding it all up he got 34 and a half years sentence him but they, they used it as concurrent I think it is um, mm -hmm. so that's the highest sentence that gets taken as mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. as the main mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. so he's got to he's got to do 15 years plus an extra two and the first time he can ask for paroles in 10 years but he was deemed a dangerous offender, he was a danger to women, he got put in the sex offenders list for life. Um, but the judge, um, I have to give him credit as well, the, he he read out the sentence in, in a way that it sort, of, it sort of comforted me to think I wasn't, I, it wasn't me that was, mm -hmm. was the problem mm -hmm. here, that this wasn't my fault. Um, I didn't ask for this, like I didn't ask to get abused, he chose mm -hmm. to abuse me and my parents sat and listened to the sentence and I've never, never seen my dad so upset in his life. Um, he was devastated. Every time the, the, the judge read out something, what he did, um, my mum just kept shaking her head saying, bastard, bastard, bastard. Um, and obviously the, the hanging from the forum, that was, he was charged for attempted murder up here and it got dropped because the PF said it was my word against his. And that, this whole, the whole, the whole legal system up here let me down because there was so much evidence, but the judge, the neighbour obviously that, that helped as well with the case, the judge took into account that in the sentence and that that did happen. That happened because there was a witness to, to concur that happened and the jury accepted that evidence as well mm -hmm. that it happened so he took that into account the judge also took into account what he did to the the man god dressed him um took into account what he did to the other girl and her her children and took into account what he did to my daughter and then that was that was that was humbling to think this this was worth something it was all this pain was worth something um, and now that this is over I can now get access to the psychological treatment mm -hmm. that I've needed. I was going to ask you that yeah. because um, and like I say I'm going to let it run because I think it's important that we know how you've managed yeah. to build your life having got the the outcome that mm -hmm. you needed but we all know that it's that doesn't, that is a far it's not from a magic over. cure. It's, uh -huh. His sentencing is far from a magic cure. To be honest, I don't think he got enough. 
Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything enough. I don't to be think honest. he got enough. Nothing will ever be enough. I hope, I hope that he doesn't ever get the opportunity again to do this to somebody else. But I will return to court as many times as I need to make sure he, he remains in prison. Um, if he did go down that line again. Um, I don't think he'll ever rehabilitate at all. Mm -hmm. This will obviously never leave me or my family's life. Yeah, yeah. It's just something I'm going to have to live with. Um, I was diagnosed with the PTSD in 2019, but I was diagnosed with agoraphobia last year. Because I've got a fear. So this is big for you then, mm -hmm. coming out to even I'm getting, tell your I'm getting better though. I am getting mm. better. See, this year I started getting back to how I was. So I'm back at the gym. I'm back getting my hair, my makeup, my nails done, taking care of myself and pride. I used to be, I used to be a girl that turned heads ten years ago. You still are. <laughs> I remember getting a bit old and wrinkly, but I turned heads and. I was I, w I was like a an it girl and I was I had full of confidence and that's coming back. Obviously I'm still I'm still affected by it. It's coming back. I'm getting a bit of freedom. I'm doing things that I wasn't doing four years ago. Um the trauma obviously is still there on a daily basis. Um I'm medicated up to the eyeballs to even get to sleep at night, so it's it's terrifying the nightmares that I get, I can hear and see and everything to do with him. Um, but I'm starting to feel safe now, mm -hmm. which is something that I've not felt in a long, long time is I feel safe. I feel, I feel okay. And the whole mobile phone thing, there's none of that that he can contact no, you from prison. He's got um, a lifelong restraining order, so he's not allowed to contact me even third party via. Right. And there's not media. been any, there's not been any well, attempt or... I can't say for certain, but there right. has things, there's things happened that only, only they would know how right. to do it. Mm -hmm. So things have happened, but I just need to obviously keep going back to the place when they do. Um, I take it you've got protection, is that right? <sighs> do you have a line? to them? Do you have support in I'd, place for yeah. stuff like that? I mean, the door would be open. That's, I have to take my hat off to the place down there. The amount of, ten, like, like, they were so tenacious. Like, they, they fought tooth and nail because they wanted this conviction so badly because they, obviously what he did to me and then what he did to the girl mm -hmm. after me, they, they worked tooth and nail to make sure he got the, the conviction he did. Um, the one thing I had in my favour was I'm very intelligent and I come across yeah, well. Yeah, you I do. I come across yep. well in court mm -hmm. and my memory is like photographic that I remembered what I was wearing and what I was doing and what I was saying and where I was and who was there. Um, and he never even, during the whole trial, he didn't even stand up and give a defence. So he sat in the dock the whole time and that was actually portrayed in the prosecution's closing speech. They just they said like that coward sitting over there can can't even take his eyes off the ground, never mind walk twenty steps to defend himself mm -hmm. in the witness box. Because he is a coward. I'm I call him a monster because there's nobody mm -hmm. that would do anything like that to a female and think that that's normal. But the fact that the the family enabled it by protecting him and covering up for him again I would never be able to do that as a mother if that was my son I would take him myself to the police station and hand him in because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want that in my household somebody like that um so yeah so it, it just finished on the 1st of November 2022 mm -hmm. and I'm starting to get the the right professional help that I should have got seven years ago that I've not had access to because it would have tainted the prosecution because mm -hmm. for me given evidence if I was healed I might have not have for, I might have not remembered yeah. like specific mm -hmm. dates mm -hmm. or it would have tainted the prosecution um but w the, I mean during the trial I was I was triggered majorly because the, the evidence with my injuries they were shown to me and that was the first time me seeing them obviously seven years down the line and I got to like page five and 
I just began shaking because I remember I'm putting cigarettes out in my eyelids. I've got scars on my eyelids. I remember that the cigarettes getting put in my, my hands, but there was a cigarette burn on in my eyes. There was a cigarette burn on my hand, and I can't remember that because mm -hmm. that must have been so minimal mm -hmm. compared, to, compared everything to everything else that he did. And when I got to that cigarette burn, like I started thinking, how can I not remember little things like this? And my daughter as well, like I took her to counselling a couple of years ago and she described my face to the counsellor and I was like, my face wasn't like that. Like, where is she getting that memory from? Because she was like, oh, my mum's face was all mm -mm, and out to here. And, and I was like, no, it wasn't. And then when I got to court and seen the photographs, I was like, oh my God, like, my face was like that. And I, how can I not remember my face being as bad as that? Because mm -hmm. I thought that was normal and I thought it looked better than what it had been by the time the police had rescued me on the 3rd of January. Mm -hmm. um, but there was bruises as well. I was holding a ruler and I can't remember doing that either. Like I was holding like a ruler next to my face with the size of the bruises and then there were, it was a ruler going down my thighs, like six inch bruises down my thighs and stuff. It was just all over my body, these bruises. and I was. So when I was looking at the photos, well... The prosecution was asking me questions. I got to like the fifth page of injuries and I just started shaking. Then it was that screaming, like I was absolutely terrorised, like screaming, getting all these memories coming back to me. And the, the judge had to stop the, the proceedings for about 20 minutes, had to take the jury out because I could not breathe. Um, looking at the, all the all this evidence, like, oh my God, this was so bad. And I've mm. minimised it for all these years to think this wasn't as bad as what it was. And I think like this Christmas, like last Christmas that just passed, that was the, the worst Christmas I think I've had in a long time because I finally accepted what he's done to mm. me and what he did to me on Christmas day, what he did to my family on Christmas day by taking me away, taking my daughter away from our mum at Christmas. And then what he did to me at New Year, it was just, I, I refuse to actually admit to myself that he he's a rapist. He raped me. He sexually assaulted me. Like I I didn't actually that didn't sink until Christmas there because I was sitting eating my Christmas dinner thinking I can't believe I'm sitting eating my Christmas dinner when seven years ago I was tied to a bed, getting absolutely mutilated by a monster. Mm -hmm. And it was just like surreal thinking this, this is this is over now. Mm -hmm. And it is over. Mm -hmm. And now the focus is rebuilding mm -hmm. your life. Yeah. As much, with the support in place. I have got a lot of support. My mum and dad are brilliant as well now. I think they needed that because they've had so many questions over the years as well like well why did you not run away why did you mm -hmm. why did you not leave why did you not run for help and after they heard the sentence and they got closure as well of how bad it was like they they didn't their expectations i think were minimized of what i actually went through but when the judge read out the the sentencing reasons for it that was when it sunk in with them and it's probably brought us closer together as well because they now appreciate I didn't just leave my daughter I didn't leave her to go and run off with a guy I mm -hmm. left my daughter to make sure she was safe mm -hmm. and I fought tooth and nail to make sure I came home alive to my daughter like that was my main drive the whole time um, and the retracting the statement in the first instance again that was to protect myself yeah, and my you daughter. You don't need to listen. Yeah. I know you want to tell I your know, story I but I feel I need to say you don't need to justify yeah, that. I think there were so many it's, people that judged me mm -hmm. although at the time like I had a lot of friends at the time and they they backed off and they had an opinion of me because me going there in the first place and what I went through and what my daughter went through they had a, a strong opinion of me and even now, since it's over, not one of them have came to me and said, I'm sorry, Laura, like, I misjudged what you went through, and I'm sorry, like, that's all I want to hear from people, and it's, I don't think I'll ever get it, and I've mm. accepted that I'll never get mm -hmm. that, because yeah. I would I would do that to somebody mm -hmm. if I knew I was in the wrong, but it's just morals, I think, that... Mm -hmm. And your most pretty, important thing is you I know, but and I think your kids. Definitely. Now. It's, mm -hmm. it's making and rebuilding a life now from 
because my life started on the 1st of November 2022 again. Mm -hmm. That was when I got a, a second chance of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not going to sit around anymore and cry every day, hate myself every day, not get dressed, not leave the house. I'm not doing that because he's taken away so much of my life already. Seven years of my life has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And he's not getting another minute of that ever again. Like he has had, he has had enough air time, mm -hmm. um, to last a lifetime, and that's why I am, I am taking pride in my appearance. I am out there and meeting you and mm -hmm. doing things. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm grateful, um, and I'm grateful that you've shared your yeah. story for other people. I think as well, like, take for awareness, you know, mm -hmm. creating awareness and I just mean, sharing. The thing is, like, if anybody was going through this in silence, they could get in touch with me, and I would happily do anything I could to help them because I never had that myself I just wanted somebody to say me too I've been there and nobody did and I just felt so alienated and alone and isolated and nobody understood what I went through because they hadn't been through it themselves mm -hmm. the only people that did understand was Women's Aid which mm -hmm. supported me and they still do to this day support me um, mm -hmm. weekly so I see Women's Aid on a weekly basis still and they've helped me get to this stage in my life that I can talk about it. Obviously it's upsetting and it will continue to be upsetting. Mm -hmm. I think I would be inhumane if I didn't right, cry no. about it, but mm -hmm. he's he's had enough of my tears. No, I um, think, mm -hmm. think that's good that damaged, you've reached. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. damaged enough of my life as well. And yeah, confident, bubbly Laura. He's <laughs> on the yeah, way yeah, back. Hopefully God forever, <laughs> forever and ever. Well, like I say, I let that run on because, well, I don't even need to explain why. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story thank with me, Laura. I me. feel extremely privileged oh, thank to, you. to have had it. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's well, been a pleasure. You're welcome. And thank you, guys. Time. Bye.